people don't remember what you say specifically. They remember how you make them feel. If I was to ask you for specific details about a book that you read five years ago, there will be very few books that you could actually tell me much about. Yet, nearly every single book that you've read, you could give me a score out of 10 about how good it was because you remember how it made you feel. And one thing that we can learn from this is that to remember details, we might need to feel the details. And that doesn't seem intuitively useful for remembering equations for a mass test or learning how to build a website. But if we look at the psychology of learning, it's pretty obvious that the current schooling system doesn't actually give us a lot of help when we want to learn anything. There's a cool diagram called the learning pyramid. And at the top of it is the worst tool that you can use for helping someone retain information. And that is giving them a lecture. It has less than 5% retention of content. The next worst thing is reading about a topic that has 10% retention. Yet as students and as adults, that's covered the majority of the ways that we try to learn stuff. Things start to get a little better if we engage in visual learning with 20% retention. And if we get a live demonstration, it even jumps up to 30%. But our learning really starts to get actually useful if we start getting involved ourselves. That can be by engaging in discussion with others around what we're learning that has 50% retention. Or if we maybe journal on the topic ourselves and basically have a conversation with ourselves. However, things get much, much better if we start practicing doing the thing and we can have 75% retention. But the best way to learn and remember anything is to teach it. In that way, you'll have maybe 90% retention of what the actual thing is that you're trying to learn. I know this might sound like it has nothing to do with what I mentioned before about emotions and how things make us feel. But if you try to memorize a math equation by reading it, it doesn't make you feel very much except for perhaps bored. But if you try to teach a math equation, you might feel embarrassed or worried about parts that you don't know much about. You will feel concerned for the people that you're teaching and which parts they may have understood or not. You'll feel ecstatic when you see someone piece things together and they get it. So there are a lot of emotions and feelings related to teaching something that you won't get just by reading it. And because all of these different feelings are applying new tests to our knowledge, we'll end up building a much deeper understanding of the topic. So the pretty obvious instant conclusion here is that if you really want to learn something, the single best thing you can do is teach it. And I certainly haven't looked back at all when it comes to running the podcast and teaching others about psychology and mindsets. It's a perfect excuse for me to do some extra research, find extra stories, engage my curiosity to try and make something as interesting as possible whilst building a much deeper set of knowledge for myself. And I would highly recommend anyone does that. And so thank you so much for being a listener and supporting me on my own journey here. And what we're going to learn about today is the Feynman technique for learning and teaching things is going to be a really interesting episode that should give you a lot to dig into, take away, and maybe teach to someone else because it's a really good system. As we've been talking about teaching, the actual concept of teaching could mean many things, which is why I want to specifically talk about Richard Feynman and his teaching technique, which is one of the things he is famous for. Feynman was actually famous for many things. He was a very influential physicist and considered one of the most brilliant teachers who has ever lived. He won a Nobel Prize in physics for his invention of a diagrammatic technique for showing different movements of particles in quantum physics. Because this helped make what was going on so much more obvious, it led to many breakthroughs because it just made the dynamics of quantum particles so much more understandable and readable for people. In fact, his lectures on physics in the Caltech University are so legendary that despite them being 60 years old, the three-part volume of his teachings are considered some of the best teaching material for university physicists or anybody who is curious in physics. So I'd really recommend you look into them if you just feel like learning more about physics. And it's just amazing how good teaching can be really influential for others. He was part of the investigation team in the Challenger shuttle disaster. And to help kind of investigate and explain to people what might be a factor, 
he famously dipped the o-ring of a shuttle into ice water to just visually demonstrate how many more problems it had when it was cold rather than trying to rely on just data in spreadsheets and the visual demonstration really played a large part in identifying the ultimate cause of the disaster which was the o-ring anyway what was his technique and where did it come from it really came from how much he hated the way that so many people teach things badly and the result in how badly then people learn things. He has a quote that says, if someone uses a lot of complexity and jargon to explain something, they probably don't understand it. And this tool for looking at things is really useful to remember because he really noticed you could see top students that would do well by just memorizing facts and terminology but didn't have the actual in-depth understanding of what all their jargon-filled statements would mean that they were just reproducing. And so he created a learning model that would prioritize teaching and breaking things down into their simplest form. It has four key stages that will help you master anything. The first is to go wide and then go deep. The second is to explain it to someone like they are five. No jargon at all, just basic words that everybody would understand. Then the third step is to then take on feedback, assess it, restudy, rewrite things, and then finally organize everything you've learned and review it. And we'll just cover these steps in a little bit of depth. So the first one is to go wide and then deep. And you need to ask yourself, what's the topic you're trying to learn and what you really want to learn about it and start with a blank page, write the topic at the top, and just write down everything that you know about that topic currently. And then using the learning pyramid that we've discussed, go from the top, like reading about it, listening about it, discussing about it, and go towards the bottom. And as you do this, add any new different learnings or insights along the way to your blank page. And this completely matches what we know from psychology about diffuse and focused models of learning. Diffuse is the more like abstract, collecting ideas, cross-pollinating things, and focused learning is about zeroing in on one thing and going deep. And yes, this step isn't fast, but the point here is to become a master. The second step is to explain it to someone like they are five. And this is progressing onto the teaching side of the pyramid. The goal is to try and find someone who doesn't have any basic understanding of what you're talking about. That's why you use the idea of a five-year-old, but it could be a friend, a partner, a colleague, a classmate, your dog, doesn't matter. And the only real requirement is that the person is considered like uninitiated in the topic you're talking about. And now you have to distill and simplify everything you've learned to a point where they could actually understand it. And as I said, that means avoiding all jargon and acronyms and terminology and really simplifying it. And this actually means that you have to deeply understand what you are talking about because you can't just rely on terminology that has a lot of concepts baked into it. You have to know what all those different underlying concepts mean to be able to explain it. And an important note here is that if you don't have someone to teach it to, you can just do this with your own notes or on a computer, write down everything you know on the topic and use simple language. And if your notes are digital, you can put them into the app called Hemingway and that will test the reading level of what you have written, which is really useful because it will tell you when you're using complicated words or complicated sentence structures that would be hard for someone to engage in and force you to break it down and make it simpler. You can also use ChatGPT, ask it to pretend to be a student that doesn't know what you're talking about and that you need to practice teaching it like it's a five-year-old and get it to score you. And this leads us nicely to step number three, which is the feedback assessment and restudying. So of course, as you know, with growth mindset, it's all about feedback and putting in that second level of practice and not just the initial and not just the initial work. You need to get honest feedback from whoever your student was and then personally reflect on your performance to form a truly honest assessment of how you did. And there are four questions you want to ask. How well were you able to explain the topic to the uninitiated person? What questions did that person ask? Which are the things that they weren't understanding that you need to dig on because you clearly don't understand it enough to be able to help them understand it? Number three is where did you just feel frustrated? Like, ah, oh, why aren't you getting this? Why can't I help you understand the things? And number four is where did you feel the urge to turn to jargon, terminology, etc.? 
and wherever you were trying to rely on jargon and concepts that had a lot of underlying meaning beneath them, that's where you weren't able to explain it clearly enough yourself and understand it enough yourself. And so answering these four questions will really bring to the surface any gaps that you have in your knowledge and understanding. And at this point, you return all the way back to step number one, study more, go wide, fill in all those little gaps that you have and come back down, go through number two, teach it to someone. And then number three, work through the feedback again and get better at it. And as I said, this isn't a super fast process. This is a process of mastery. This will make you an absolute genius in the thing. If you are studying for an exam and you have a month, you can go through this actual process and you will know better than anybody else sitting the exam what it is you're talking about. Let's move to step number four, which is organize, convey, and review. Organize your elegantly simple understanding of the topic into a clear, compelling story or narrative or a lecture or a podcast and try and convey it to at least a few other people. Continue to iterate on it, refine it accordingly and make it the best thing you can. And this might sound like both a lot of work and also sort of pointless, but if you're interested in something, the best thing to do is to teach it. That could be writing short blogs, tweet threads, making some visualizations. It doesn't matter what you like doing. If you start doing it, you'll get much better at it. And as I said at the start, emotions are important here. The emotion of exposing yourself will really help fill in the gaps in your knowledge. Every time that I publish an episode on the podcast, over the next week, I am having more ideas of how I could have done the episode better. And it's kind of annoying, but it's those emotions that are suddenly finding those extra gaps that I missed that would help me make things more clear, that would help me explain the topic better. And the feeling of scrutinized is incredibly powerful. And there's a funny saying that in life, you don't get rewarded by talking about a thousand things. You get rewarded by talking about the same thing a thousand different ways. And hey, I run a podcast on psychology and mindsets, mental models and mastery. And if I tried to cover absolutely everything, it would be chaos. But there's a pretty wide range of things I can talk about and just cycling through them and getting better and better and teaching you lots of different ways to learn what is fundamentally the same kind of concepts around self-improvement and personal growth is a really cool way to become a master of something. Whilst we're talking about sayings, I have two more great sayings. The first is from James Clear, and that is that mastery requires a lot of practice. But the more that you practice something, the more boring and routine it can feel. Because of this, we can see that an essential component of mastery is the ability to maintain enthusiasm and to continue mastering the fundamentals and finding them interesting. And I think reiterating through your knowledge and adding to it and making it better and making it deeper and helping other people understand it is a really good way to keep it interesting and to keep that enthusiasm for yourself. And one of the other really important points here is from writer Neil Gaiman. And he says that the most important part of getting better at something is to just finish it, to ship it, to put something out there and take the risk of it not being good enough. That means not giving up when something is difficult or imperfectly formed, but finding a way of committing to being a completer, to it reaching at least step two of the Feynman technique and teaching it to someone, and to not leave our half-baked knowledge in our heads where it feels safe and unjudged because of the biggest part of growth mindset is the putting yourself out there and getting feedback. And when our thoughts stay within us, they're never really seeing the light of day and we're never seeing the holes within them. That whole part of what are the bits that are frustrating that I can't get someone to understand? Where am I trying to use jargon? Those are the moments where you're realizing that you don't actually know what you think you know. And that's so important. So commit to finishing stuff and just putting it out there. And that's where so much of the learning is going to happen. Okay, sweet. We understand the Feynman technique and now you can use this in your life to master anything. And it's such a powerful framework. The best entrepreneurs, investors, scientists, artists, politicians, and thinkers at large, they have all leveraged this technique in some way, whether they were truly aware of it or not. What lies in common in their genius is their ability to abstract complexity and convey ideas in simple, digestible ways that other people can then understand. Otherwise, the idea is useless if no one gets it. It's actually kind of obvious. Just think of some of the best speeches of Steve Jobs conveying the importance of the iPhone in simple terms or 
Martin Luther King explaining to people what his dream was. It's so easy to overcomplicate things and to try to intimidate others with our knowledge when actually we haven't realized that we don't know what we're talking about. And I'm sure we are all aware of people who do try to do this and intimidate others with lots of words that sound like they have knowledge, but don't be fooled. Complexity in jargon is used as a way to mask a lack of their own deeper understanding. So be better and be simpler. Use the Feynman technique and find the beauty in simplicity. And to sum this up, my second favorite story of Richard Feynman and his teaching is something that just really shows his character. And this is the story of when he was working on the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, the one where they were building a nuclear bomb. And he thought that security for the most top secret project in the world should perhaps be better. And to make the point, he taught himself some of the basics of picking locks and picking safes, and he'd break into different offices and safes on the compound that contained incredibly top secret information, and he'd leave a handwritten note to just teach the important lesson that their security was complete crap. If there was someone there that wasn't undercover spy, they could be rifling through every single document they wanted to, because he could just go around at night without anyone even noticing he was there and do all this stuff. And I think that even a five-year-old could have understood this message that he was giving the people running Los Alamos. And I just think that story is nuts. If you want to find out what my other favorite story is about him, well, this episode is long enough, so it will be coming up another time. And on that, thank you so much for listening. And if you do notice someone in your life who drowns you in jargon every time they try to explain something, do feel free to send them this episode to hopefully teach them a thing or two about simplifying their message. And if you are a fan of this episode or the show, then please do us a solid one and leave a good review wherever you get your podcasts, as it does genuinely make a difference. Even a five-year-old can tell the difference between a show with five reviews and a show with 5,000 reviews. And if a five-year-old can do it, then so can anybody else who's browsing their podcast player. Enough of me being an annoying podcaster trying to get reviews and moving on to me being a non-annoying podcaster who is happy to talk to his actual listeners. And you might remember that I said feedback is really important. Well, I would love to hear from you about what I can do more of, what I can do less of, whatever you have going on in your life that you think I can help with directly in a conversation or to make content that would delight you more so in general. And you can book a call with me now for free on Wednesdays using the link in the description. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just really enjoy meeting my listeners and hearing what you're up to and where my podcast comes up in your life if that's what you want to talk about or chatting about psychology, books or whatever you feel like it, it is up to you. And if you are snooping through the description, also feel free to sign up to my newsletter. And on that, remember, life is too short for jargon-filled nothingness. So TBC, SMA to lol, uh, don't forget to be kind to yourself, climb a tree and smile at strangers because they are all people.